Hello, my name is Joe Carr. When fans start listing the legends from the long and glorious history of Providence College basketball, it doesn't take long to get to the name Ernie DiGregorio. First team All-American, NBA Rookie of the Year, a leader and a star on the team that made the Friars famous in the 1973 Final Four, and the ultimate local guy makes good story. That's Ernie D, and Ernie's our guest today. Thanks for joining us, Ernie. Joe, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Great to be here in the <laughs> Rowan Fryer Development Center, where the Friars practice now, the home of Fryer basketball. I heard you missed a shot the other day out there, though. Yeah, I can miss a lot of them now. <laughs> At 72 years old, it gets a little tougher to bend those knees. But you made the other nine. Well, so you know, that, that's pretty good. I used to shoot free throws when I was 10 years old, all the way up till 27, 100 a day, and keep track. So when you do it and you keep track, once you start making 93, 94 in a row, you feel pretty confident on that free throw line. That muscle memory is a great thing. <laughs> yeah. Kim English and his staff seem to be making a real effort to keep the program alumni involved in the program. Do you, are you feeling that? And Do you think that's important? Oh, I think it's hugely important because, you know, that's what makes this college what it is, the alumni and the history. And he's a tremendous coach and a, even a better person. I, I really come to a lot of practices and really respect the fact that he asked my opinion and uh, lets me talk to the team and my teammate Kevin Stakem. So uh, he's been special. And there's a real uh, connector to all this, a guy named Harold Starks, who played for the Friars in the late 80s. He's on the senior staff here in athletics, too, and a former player, a guy who really forges those connections, doesn't he? Yeah, he does a great job with the former players, and uh, I have a lot of respect for Harold. I always tell him he was a defensive player, but he definitely couldn't stop me. <laughs> Goes without saying, that's for sure. <laughs> so what's your outlook for the Friars this year? As we speak, they're 2-0, and preparing to play Wisconsin tomorrow night. A good start. No question. you, you got to keep winning games, and uh, they have, like, I think, eight or nine players that will contribute. They play, play really hard. Um, the only thing that scares me about any team today, whether it be PC or any team, is I think when you rely on that three-point shot all the time, there's an old saying in the NBA, you live by the jumper, you die by the jumper. I'd like to see any team take it to the basket and get fouled and get free throws because it gives you that confidence and getting a rhythm. But uh, PC's been playing great, and uh, I look for them to have a real good year. Yeah, it'll be fun to see how it plays out. When you go to games at the Amp and look at 12,000 people there, it's just an incredible home court atmosphere. Do you ever think about the fact that you played on the first team that played in what was then the Civic Center and all of this has become in terms of a home, home environment? Oh, yeah, it's, it's huge. The Providence has a history going way back, you know, with Joe Mullaney of uh, supporting the team and really loving uh, their friars. And uh, you have to use that to your advantage and come out and be aggressive and uh, get the crowd involved because when the crowd gets involved, then the officials get involved and they don't want to blow a whistle and have 12,000 people screaming at them. You get to start getting the calls. So I really like the way uh, PC plays really hard and taking it to the basket and getting the crowd involved. Spoken like somebody who's won a lot of basketball games. So well, we pretty... never lost when I was there in the <laughs> Civic Center because we had this guy named Marvin Bonds who could rebound and uh, he made a difference. One of the reasons we wanted to visit with you today is to talk about your autobiography, A Star with a Broken Heart. So this, this title of the book says a lot about what you are trying to, to say with this, with this piece. Tell us the story that you want us to, well, to learn from this book. <clears throat> the story is that, um, you know, I grew up watching the great players at Providence College. Lenny Wilkins, Johnny Egan, Jimmy Walker, and you can go on and on. And that made such a, an impression on me, I wanted to play for Providence College. And I did it. I was fortunate to play for a great coach and a brilliant human being, and Dave Gavitt, who uh, was our coach and went on to establish the Big East and become a major power in uh, college basketball. And also, my teammate was Marvin Bonds, the rebounder, defensive player, and a dear friend of mine. As the years went on, we bonded, the three of us, and we had a relationship that was really strong. And this book is about the history of the three of us together fighting our battles on and off the court. And in the end, you know, they both have deceased and they passed away, and I'm the only guy left, and I just thought it was important for me to tell the story about those special moments that I cherish that we had together. 
And the title of the book is, you know, with those two guys gone, my family, my basketball family is no longer there. So I thought of the title, believe it or not, when I was driving to Buffalo because I couldn't come up with the title. And uh, I was singing to myself because trying to stay awake in the car. And I came up with a star with a broken heart. And I said, gee, that sounds like the title. And I called my daughter who went to PC and graduated. She loved it. And I called my buddy from TJ Maxx, this gentleman Ben Camerata, the founder. And he loved it. And that's how we got the title. So much of the book is really about, focuses on, on your relationship with Marvin Barnes. You refer to him many times as your brother. There's a great anecdote near the beginning of the book about him coming to your home in North Providence for Sunday dinners with your family. Yep. Tell, just tell us about your relationship with your teammate. And <clears throat> well, the thing that we had was we both had the same goal, which was to be a professional basketball player. So we worked hard every single day in practice to reach that goal. And we became very close. In those days, race relationship was really crazy, just like, you know, it still is now. You know, a lot of the blacks hated the whites. The whites hated the blacks. And it was really weird that him and I got together because all my friends used to say, what are you hanging with that guy for? for? And his friends used to say, why are you hanging, you know, with Ernie D? You know, he's not black. And so... We never looked at color. We just looked at the goal, and, and he was a funny guy, and he was really smart, you know, and uh, we just got along really well. Uh, he eventually came to my wedding, and he used to come over my house on Sundays and eat dinner with my family. He loved my mother made, like a typical Italian mother, macaroni and meatballs, and I used to go to his house with his mother, Lula, who was a beautiful lady, and uh, we just formed a relationship that was unbreakable. Tell us about his game, the things he could do on the court. Well, he was a, he was a uh, <clears throat> very coordinated six foot nine guy that when he got a rebound, he would pitch me the ball and I would throw him a long pass. And even if you threw it at his feet, he was so coordinated, he could catch it in stride and score. <clears throat> Excuse me. So he was very uh, naturally gifted as far as having coordination. But what separated him from almost anybody, and if you look into the PC yearbook, he sets all the records for rebounds. I mean, he averaged like 19 rebounds for three years in a row, which was phenomenal. And when he rebounded, he would get me the ball, and sometimes he'd be the first guy to beat everybody down the court and get a layup. So he had some unbelievable skills when college, then went on to the ABA and developed his offensive game and became a great offensive player on top of it. Because there was no limit to how great he was. So was it essentially a fast break offense, which yeah, has we to ran. start with a defensive rebound, right? <clears throat> yeah, so. Coach Gavitt was super because he had no ego. A lot of coaches like to control their players and tell them where to go and what pass and do this. Coach Gavitt knew that I had an ability to make people better and pass the ball, and you know, he let me do my thing. He let me set up people. As soon as Marvin rebounded, he got it to me, and we were off to the races. If we didn't get a fast break layup, then we would just move the ball. I tell people to this day, they still don't believe it. We never ran a play. <clears throat> if we played zone, <laughs> we'd get in the gaps and move the ball. If we played against man to man, we'd play pick and roll. But he had the first team All-American. Both of us were, you know, in each other's years. And then he had two guys that made rookie of the year in the NBA, me, and Marvin made rookie of the year in the ABA. So he had two really talented players. What an era this was. So Marvin came along for your second year, and then Kevin Stakem transferred in for your third year from Holy Cross. So you have the three of you on the team that, that went to the Final Four, and we'll talk a lot more about that experience <coughs> in a few minutes. But it's also, as we mentioned, the transition to playing at the big arena downtown. Did you have a sense that this was really growing into something big? Yeah, we knew it. We knew our junior year, you know, Marvin had a year experience that we had a great team. And Coach Gavin did something that very few coaches ever do. He took me in his office and he said, Ernie, you got the keys to the offense. We're going to go as far as you can take it. And any player, that's a player's dream to be allowed to make mistakes and to be able to create. And he allowed me to throw behind the back passes and all those things. And so the thing that made Coach Gavitt special was he had no ego. 
uh, he let us be ourselves and let us play to our strengths. And uh, when we added Kevin Stakem, we added someone who could score on the wing and could run. So now we had the whole nucleus. And then Costello, Frank Costello gave us a 6'9 guy who could rebound, who was unselfish. And Nehru King could stick the little short jumper and could run. And Crawford could rebound. So we had six players. And we uh, went 24-2 and two with six players. So the third person in this holy trinity of Friar basketball and the other subject of this book, whom you talk a lot about in the book, is Coach Gavitt. What was it about him that made him special to you beyond his prowess and his expertise as a coach? Well, because he was a real person. You know, uh, he didn't think he was better than anyone and treated us all with respect. And the players would run through a wall for him because they knew he had our back. He kept it very simple. And he allowed us to use our strengths and cover up our weaknesses. And every single day we went to practice, it was fun. And we couldn't wait to have practice because we knew we were getting better. And his philosophy was always, it's not where you start, it's where you finish. Because he wanted us peaking for the NCAA tournament at the end of the year. And that year, our se my senior year, we made it to the Final Four in... We were 16 points ahead of Memphis State until Marvin got hurt, and then we couldn't run our fast break, and so we got beat. So we would have had a great chance of beating that team, Memphis State, and played UCLA for the final, and that would have been the second time we played them. We played them out in Porve Pavilion early in the year, and we played them a close game, but we lost, but uh, we were peaking. <clears throat> and these relationships continued after the, your playing days and Marvin's ended later in the, in the 1970s. Let's talk about all the, some of the, the things that happened around these relationships, and a lot of it has to do with the demons that, that Marvin Barnes faced. His struggles are well known uh, throughout much of the, rest, the rest of his life. He became a teammate really of a different kind. Tell us more about your relationship with Marvin over yeah. the next 40 years, really, until he died in 2014. Yeah, Coach Gavitt always used to tell me, Ernie, your greatest assist <clears throat> wasn't on the basketball court. It was keeping your brother alive. And <clears throat> Marvin struggled. We all knew it. He had his times where, you know, he cleaned up and got his act together. But those demons always came back. And I chronicle them in the book how both me and Coach Gavitt did everything we could to help Marvin. And uh, we had some success. But in the end, you know, the drugs won. And uh, we lost him. But um, the experiences we had that are outlined in the book were really unique and special because they were two really great people and so talented in their own ways. You know, Coach Gavitt was a genius in college basketball for years after he retired from coaching, and Marvin was a genius on the court. And uh, it was very special, and when I lost those guys, you know, I lost family because they were my basketball family. It's notable that several times during the book you write about how you and Coach Gavitt strategized about how to help Marvin. You recount a number of phone conversations, in-person conversations about, okay, what are we going to do now and, and how are we going to get to Marvin? Yeah, because Coach is a lot smarter than me. I mean, <laughs> Marvin would laugh at me, but he respected Coach Gavitt. And uh, he would listen to Coach Gavitt because he knew that Coach Gavitt loved him and had his back and didn't want anything bad to happen to him. But uh, Coach was special. He, he cared about people, and he was a, a, a great human being besides being a brilliant basketball coach. And obviously you did too, because even when you were in the NBA in 1976, you related an anecdote about you were playing for the Buffalo Braves. You took time away from your team to go to Detroit to visit with Marvin and check. It sounded really sort of like an intervention yeah. to check in with Marvin. But that's during the season. Really remarkable that you would do that. Well, because, uh, you know, Marvin can go bad quick. You know, he, he had a history of once he got on those drugs, you know, it was tough to stop. And, uh, you know, he worked so hard to get himself clean. You'd hate to see him, you know, something happen to him and, you know, lose his salary. And, you know, more importantly, you know, something bad happened. So uh, Coach Gavin, I would always call him for advice on how to help you know, make the situation better for Marvin, and, and we all work together, even my other teammates, to make it better for him. 
your numbers. 15 and 24 were raised to the rafters the same day. In the book, you have a nice story about the conversation you had with Marvin that day yeah. on the court. Can you relay, repeat that for us? Yeah, it was crazy because <clears throat> I get emotional. I'm an emotional person, and I was very close to my family, so I immediately thought of my mother, you know, because she passed away, how happy she would be. And then I went over to Marvin to give him a hug, and uh, he was telling me <clears throat> he was a warrior, and I'm saying to myself, what the hell is this guy talking about? I'm a warrior. And uh, I couldn't figure it out until, you know, later when I left, and what I guess he meant was, you know, he had so many demons and so many issues with his health and, you know, the drug history that he, uh, you know, for him to be standing there at that time and getting his, you know, number raised to the rafter proved that he was a warrior and he fought through all those demons and he was really excited in being there. And uh, that was a very special and emotional time for me. So again, the book is called A Star with a Broken Heart. It's available from Barnes & Noble now. We'll put information in the show notes about how you can get your hands on a copy. And we're also planning for some book signing events at Games at the Amp before very long and also at the Barnes & Noble bookstore here on the Providence College campus. So that's uh, a little more about the, about the book and its availability. Let's talk just a little more broadly about basketball. I'd like to go back to 1972-73 and have you kind of put things in context for us. That's around the time where college basketball is exploding, national television. I think a lot of this probably relates to the success of the first Lou Alcindor and later Bill Walton UCLA teams under Coach Wooden. But the, the profile of the sport was really kind of beginning to explode. Did you sense that? Do you, do you think I that's think kind the, of what happened at that time? Yeah, I think the more visibility in the television that got involved, <clears throat> now you get ESPN coming in and you get all these networks and you know, there's so many games on that it exploded basketball. Um, that was a great time in 73 for me because of I had the opportunity to play for Providence College. And uh, what a history Providence College has, Joe. You know, Lenny Wilkins, Johnny Egan, Jimmy Walker. I mean, you can go way back, way before we played in 73, and we just wanted to be just like them. The Friars were eliminated by, by Memphis State in that Final Four, as you mentioned just a minute ago. Most fans seem to agree with you that if Marvin had not gotten hurt in that game, there's virtually no way we would have lost well, we to Memphis State and would have been into the right, into We were the 16 ahead game. and we were running it down their throats, so we would have kept running and running, and uh, I, I would, couldn't believe that they could come back. and They couldn't stop it. Uh, but when he left and he couldn't run anymore and his knee locked up on him, we couldn't get the rebound, and you can't run unless you get a, you know, a rebound and mm -hmm. throw an outlet pass. So we had to play half court, and uh, they were too big. They would get two and three shots on the offensive end, and we'd be one and done when we shot. So that made the difference. You can't it, when you take 19 rebounds out of the game. You know, <laughs> that's that's a difference. And the other team on the other side of the bracket was Indiana. And yeah. this sounds like a bad <laughs> idea, but there was a third place game. In the final yeah. four, you ended up playing yeah. against Indiana? Yeah, because, you know, once you lose, you're deflated. Right. And, you know, the third place game is like no one's really playing with any purpose because, you know, you, you, you go for the national championship. They eventually got rid of that third place game and they don't have Good it. idea. Yeah, right. because it didn't make any <laughs> sense. Because now this March Madness has ballooned to like a spectacle where everybody watches it. But at least it's an opportunity for me to ask you if you had any, beyond that, any other interaction with Bobby Knight, who, of course, just died recently, so a lot of people have been sharing Bobby yeah. Knight stories. No, I never really knew Bobby Knight that well, but uh, my teammate, Kevin Stakem, uh, did because his teammate and my teammate, John Havlicek at Boston, he used to be Bobby Knight's teammate at Ohio State. So uh, a lot of times, Kevin said uh, he would go out on a road trip with uh, the Celtics and Havlicek would go out to lunch with Bobby Knight and Kevin would go, so you got to know him. Yeah. It wasn't very long <laughs> after that, right? So four years later, he had the undefeated team, right? 76, oh, yeah. so yeah. beginning he, to put he, that he, together. He could coach. He just had a temper. You know what I mean? That temper, sooner or later, will catch up with you. Quite a figure in the history of the sport, that's for sure. Yeah. So after that senior <laughs> season, you had an interesting experience, which was the opportunity to play for Team USA in a six-game sort of barnstorming tour with a team against a team from the Soviet Union, coached by your sort of stylistic ancestor Bob Cousy, 
What was that experience like for you, and how did that help get you prepared for starting to play in pro basketball? It was very physical. Russia uh, played a very physical brand of basketball. They looked like football players. They were really big. They didn't have the fluidity that the USA had, but uh, they had the physical strength, and they wanted a bang. And it was a great six-game series. We had a lot of fun. Uh, they beat us twice. I think we beat them four times. The big game for me and Marvin was the one in Madison Square Garden where um, we beat them in overtime. And I put a little dribbling show on at the, at the end when they were trying to get the ball. And I hit Marvin and he dunked it underneath. And I remember him running down the court with his arms up in the air. So uh, that, that six-game series was really good because in the beginning we had Walton on our team. But the Russians went for his knees and he quit after one game. So... After that, you know, it was more a freelance, open type of, of a game, fast break, and uh, I had a lot of fun. It really gave me some great exposure to the national TV audience. Didn't you hit a shot in Madison Square Garden to put that game into overtime? Yeah, too? I yeah. hit the, the last two buckets, you know, and uh, to get us there. And I remember after that game, I was exhausted. Uh, in very <laughs> few games, I can actually say that I was spent, but I was, I was exhausted. Now, those games <laughs> meant a lot, too, back again to historical context, because that's just a, a little more than a year after Team USA really got robbed in the Olympics exactly. in that game against, against the Russian team. The only time up to that point, USA, the Team USA had failed to win the gold medal. So I suspect that there was a lot of emotion and really some extra pressure because of that, right? Yeah, well, I didn't feel the pressure, because when you play this game and you play it as much as I did, it's just part of who you are. And, and uh, uh, to succeed at a certain level, you never think of pressure. You just do what you do every single day. Remember, I played this game 10 hours a day since I was 10 years old. If you're not good after that, you better give it up. <laughs> so, uh, but a lot of people were wanting revenge after the U.S. got robbed. Everybody knows, you know, they won that game and that was, you know, that was terrible. But uh, we, it was really physical. Russia was no slouch, I'm telling you. They were good. What was the story about you talking Bob Cousy into changing the offense and learning <laughs> to run? <laughs> yeah, well, when Walton left, that left Swen Nader as our center. His back up at UCLA. Exactly. Right? And, and, you know, it's one thing to throw the ball into Walton because he was a great <laughs> passer and he was such a great player. He made everybody better. But Swen Nader didn't have that skill. So... Coach Cousy wanted us to keep throwing the ball to Swan Nader. And I said, you know, I called up my agent. I said, you know, I'm out of here. He said, what do you mean? I says, Walton's one thing, but to throw it to Swan Nader, I mean, that's crazy. He says, do me one favor. Before you leave, go talk to the coach. So I went into Cousy's uh, uh, room, hotel room, knocked on a door. He was with his uh, coach in college, Buster Sherry. And I said, Coach, I'm leaving. He said, well, what do you mean you're leaving? I says, exactly. You know, you want to get the ball into Swan Nader. He's not Bill Walton. He said, I said, all these other guys feel the same way, but they're scared to tell you. He says, well, what do you want? I said, just let us open it up. Let us freelance. Let us run. And no one knew how to run more than Bob Cousy, right? right. He was the, the, the magician. He kind of the invented battle. it, yes. Yeah, he invented right. it. So he said, you got it. So he let us run, and the rest was history. We played great. So after that around there, you're drafted third overall by the Buffalo Braves. But at that time, there's also the ABA yep. in operation. You're picked there by the Kentucky Colonels. And yep. part of the draw to Kentucky might have been that Joe Mullaney, who had recruited you initially to PC, was the coach yeah. there. But, but you decided to go in the uh, NBA direction and play with Buffalo. Take us through that thought process and that decision. Well, you know, my whole life, I've always been told, you know, I'm too short. I'm too slow. I could never play at Class A in, in uh, high school, I played in B. We won the B championship, he could never play in A. Then I went to prep school, they say he could never play at college. Then I went to PC as a freshman, and we won a lot of games, and I scored 30 points, he'll never make the varsity. Then I make the varsity, he'll never be an All-American. Then I was an All-American, he'll never be a pro. Then I was rookie of the year. One guy said it best, Joe, he said to me, Ernie D, after you made rookie of the year, the only skeptics that remain are the true skeptics. So I knew in my heart, you know, I understand the money's very important on both sides. You've got to listen to the ABA and the NBA. But I wanted to play against the greatest players in the world because that was a lifelong dream of mine to compete against 
Jerry West, Oscar Robinson, Earl Monroe, Tiny Archibald. These guys were unbelievable, Calvin Murphy. And um, I did it. So even though we had, you know, negotiations with Kentucky and I sat through them and they offered more money than Buffalo, I definitely wanted to play in the NBA and that's why I picked the NBA. Is it uh, accurate to say that Joe Mullaney initially recruited you at PC and he was in on your decision to, to pick Saint, the Thomas More prep uh, yeah. route, right, before coming to PC? Yeah, Joe was here. Dave was at Dartmouth. You know, he went to Dartmouth, the coach's alma mater. And I had a lot of respect for Joe Mullaney. He really knew the game. And I used to go to a lot of PC games in Alumni Hall and watch, you know, all the great players, you know, Walker and uh, I seen Larinaga, Colucci and Donnie Lewis and players like that. And uh, just the TV of watching PC and Chris Clark put an impression in my brain that I said, I got, I, that's where I gotta go because I had scholarships all over the country, you know, and I didn't even visit another school. That's how my mind was set that PC is where I have to go. And, and you know, I, I always told Coach Gavitt in the book, I say that after it was done, the reality of playing, f the dr a dream for playing for PC was one thing, but the reality was better than the dream. You know, the way it turned out, the, the uh, career I had there and, and that last year was so special that, what, 50 years later, we're sitting here talking about it. Let's talk a little bit more about the NBA experience and what an <laughs> era of the NBA. Of everybody you played against, who are you most proud of having shared the court with? Well, that's a tough question. There's, there's so many great ones. But I got a kick out of uh, playing against Pete Maravich because he was such a showman, you know. And one of my favorite stories in the book was that um, we used to fly commercial in those days. And we just got beat by Atlanta and we're both flying out of Buffalo Airport. And I used to have my little headsets and I'm sitting on the ground waiting to get boarded and stuff like that. And uh, Pete comes up to me and I had been benched and not playing that much. And so I was going through a tough time. And he says, Ernie D, how you doing? I said, I'm all right, Pete. He says, remember one thing. Once they get your confidence, it's one flew over the cuckoo's nest. <laughs> and I'll never forget that, you know, because he went through some tough times, you know, when he played. Sometimes when you make a lot of money and, and other people don't, there's an envy factor there. And so Maravich went that through his career, and I had a little bit of that myself when I played in Buffalo. But uh, the, one of the most things I'm proud of is even though I was so upset with Ramsey because, you know, he benched me and didn't play me a lot at the end, then he eventually got fired. I became really good friends with him at the end of his life, he, he passed away from cancer. And maybe about a year before, I called him up and buried the hatchet and we became good friends and he was happy and I kept really close with him. So that, that's special to me to know that I had that relationship with, with him at the end of his life. Yeah, that's a great story. Now, w during your playing days in your second career, the injury happened and yep. that really changed everything. So tell us about that, how it happened and what that did to the trajectory of your career. Yeah, um, when I um, had my rookie year, you know, being rookie of the year speaks for itself. I led the league in assists and free throws. And then my second year, we play up in Boston. The first game I start off in Boston with 33 points. Because once you get that experience, you know, you're a lot better player. You're a lot more comfortable. You have a lot more poise. And we go home and play Chicago, and I had 25. So I'm saying to myself, this is going to be an all-star year. I'm going to be an all-star this year. <clears throat> then we go out to the West Coast and play some games. First game is Golden State in, in Golden State. And I just made a, a step to my left and turned to make a, just a normal pass. And I fe felt a little pinch in my knee. And then it swelled up. So I knew something was wrong. And I came out of the game. And we continued on that West Coast trip to Phoenix, Seattle, uh, and a couple other places. And everywhere I went, they had a doctor check me, you know. They didn't really go through a thorough uh, examination, but they checked my knee and they said, you know, you just strained it, you'll be fine, start lifting weights. And I knew something's wrong because my knee never ever swelled up. So I get home to Buffalo and I go see our team doctor, Steve Joyce, who was a great guy. 
And I said, Doc, how you doing? He said, not too good. My mom just had a stroke. And when I heard that news, I said to myself, I bet you I don't have any good news either. And they shot my knee with a die, like a, that's how they did it. And they had me bend down. I could still feel the pain. Oh, it hurt. And there was a torn cartilage. Now today, they go in with arthroscopic surgery and they just take the cartilage out and boom, you're ready to play in a couple of weeks. Then they took the whole cartilage out, put you in a full cast, put you in a hospital for four or five days. So <clears throat> when I came back, I felt good. I was jumping, I was almost dunking it. But the doctor told me I wasn't locking my leg. They wanted you to put your leg straight and, and lock your knee. So he made me do these weightlifting things all over again. And it was dragged on for about a month or so. When I came back, the team was winning. And they didn't want to change that chemistry, which I can understand. So I never played that much. But, uh, you know, I say to myself, people say, well, that's too bad. I say it could have happened in college, and I would have never even been rookie of the year and you know, never signed that great contract that I did sign. So I have no regrets. That's, that's part of life. You, know, you, you have ups and downs, and that was one of the tough times. A little bit out of order, but let's go back to the, the better times and talk about that. Rookie of the year, <laughs> looking at some of the things that happened that season, having one game with 25 assists, New Year's Day. Yeah. In 1974, for, in, uh, Portland. For, in Portland, of all places. So that was great. But uh, leading the NBA in free throw shooting is pretty tricky when Rick Barry is in the NBA, right? Exactly. So you, that was pretty close. You had to you just kind of edged him out. <laughs> You're right. And the amazing thing is, we were out in Golden State a day early before we were playing them. They had a game. I went to the game. And we were like, you could see all year long in the newspaper. He was ahead of me by percentage points. I was right behind. So he goes to the line. He does that other hand thing. I yell, miss it. And he missed it. And I beat him like 0.902 to 0.899. So maybe I got lucky that I booed him and he missed it. Taking matters into your own hands. That's, yeah, that's a I good idea. To. That's I right. had to. So after the uh, period of your career in Buffalo, you had a, a brief time in L.A. with Lakers. That didn't go very well. But then you ended up back in New England. You finished your career with the Boston Celtics, what do you, how do you reflect on your NBA career at, in its entirety? Any regrets? No, you can't look back and regret. I, I, you know, it could have been a lot better if I didn't get hurt. You know, I would have played 10, 15, 12 years and, you know, would have done some amazing things. But, you know, that, that's the card God gives you and you have to deal with it. Uh, but, like, I'll be going back to Buffalo this week and, and the people love me there. And... It's, it was a great four years in Buffalo because of some of the things I accomplished. And to play with the Lakers with Jabbar was, was interesting. But to be able to throw John Havlicek, his last basket, the last assist anybody gave to him, that's a special thing in my life. So I look back at my career and say, uh, five years, you know, I had some great moments, I had some tough moments, but uh, I wouldn't change it. I'm glad you mentioned Hondo. So his last game was your last game. Yeah. Obviously, it seems from the way you wrote about, about him in the book, he was someone you admired. He was oh. my favorite player when I was a kid. What was that relationship like? First of all, he's the most humble guy you ever want to meet. And he's such a gentleman. He played so hard. You know his history as well as anyone. He did some unbelievable things, you know. He, the guy was just a great, great competitor. And, like, after we played them in the playoffs our first year in Buffalo, we lose in Buffalo the sixth game. He comes in the locker room looking for me to come and shake my hand and tell me what a great year I had. So, I mean, that shows you what type of person he is. Why does he have to do that? He's John Havlicek. And then when I played with him at Boston, he was funny because Boston used to have practice. They'd throw the ball up and play a game of seven when it stay out. <clears throat> so his team won the game. I come in the next team, and he's next to me, and he's holding my pants and stuff, and he says, Ernie D., this is your big chance. He said, Red has got a keen eye on you. You better play good. I looked over in the stands, and our back was... <laughs> <laughs> he was sleeping. <laughs> so he had a sense of humor. He was, he was just special, really special. So in a lifetime of playing basketball, you were involved in thousands of plays. I'd like to talk about one. And you wrote about it in the book. It's in the St. Louis, 1973, yeah. in the Final Four. We see it on the video screen at the app yeah. every once in a while, too, that 
unbelievable behind the back pass to Kevin Stakem. Best pass I've ever seen. I think probably the best pass anybody's ever seen. Tell us about that play. Well, first of all, like I talk about Coach Gavitt, where he had no ego. He, he would, that was my game. My game was I practiced 10 hours a day dribbling the ball. And I didn't have to look at the ball. So I could see the floor. That one play, and so I threw those behind the back passes all the time in practice for, for years. And never once did Coach Gavitt ever say, you know, don't do any of that stuff. It wasn't I was being fancy. That was part of my game. So in Memphis, we're playing Memphis State in the uh, Final Four. And I get a ball thrown to me. And as soon as I got it, I want to run. And I see Kevin open, but there was a player right in front of me, so I couldn't throw it like this. So I just turned, took a dribble and turned, and threw it behind my back, like three quarters length of the court. It went through two guys, and Kevin fumbled it at first, and then he <laughs> regained possession and laid it in. So what was amazing to me about that play, not that I threw the pass, was the reaction of the crowd. There was like all of a sudden, the crowd just went quiet, like saying, what the hell is this guy doing? This guy's nuts. And then when they seen the guy catch it and laid it in, they went crazy. So that was probably the greatest pass I ever threw. You know, and I threw some pretty good ones. Was, whatever happened to the behind-the-back pass? It's a lost art, isn't it? You don't see well, it anymore. the three-point so. play has changed the whole game. So people drive in now, and instead of shooting a, a five-foot jump shot or a layup, they throw it out to a guy 30 feet away. I'd rather be shooting a, a two-footer than a 30-footer. I guarantee it's a lot easier. I'm interesting you should mention that one. I was interested in your perspective on that. You obviously had some range, so you would have hit some three-pointers, but it sounds like you <laughs> you're prefer to have played in the era oh, before the three-pointer. If don't I would like have it. played with a three-point line, I would have never passed because <laughs> it's so easy. And then all of a sudden Marvin would say, if he can do it, I want to do it. Then he'd start shooting threes. I think the beauty of the game was when players run. PC played uh, that game the other night, and they had a couple of fast breaks in a row, and it looked so pretty, you know, when you, you get that guy and you lay it off and he dunks it or lays it in. That's, that's the kind of basketball I like to watch. It, of course, changed the way defenses are set up, too, so that the outside shots aren't really there. You had the, working the ball inside would create the opportunity outside when you were playing, and that's, yeah. that's all different now, right? It's a totally different game. That's for sure. Uh, a couple more contemporary things before we, we wrap up. Yep. You had a teammate when you played at PC, a guy by the name of Jim Laranega. Yep. And look at this. He's still coaching. The Friars might even be playing him a week or so from now. Did you always see a coach in Jim Laranega? Yeah, I did, because he was a real smart player. He knew how to – he didn't over-dribble it. He kept the game simple. He moved without the ball. And you could tell, the first time I ever played with him, I knew the guy knew how to play. You know, and uh, he just carried that over. And I think the thing that makes him a special coach, and I watch him coach, in fact, I've even gone down to Miami to visit him, is he simplifies it. He doesn't overcoach it. In other words, to me, there's no advantage if you throw the ball 15 times around the outside. The, the key is to get it in the basket. So Laranega will let one of his players isolate and just go one-on-one -on -one and score or go two-on-two. -two. And when you do that, there's less chance of making mistakes. I think it's really important when any team plays to recognize what a good shot is. In other words, Havlicek used to tell me, if, if you can't make a 15-foot shot, you shouldn't be playing. So sometimes guys will get open from 15 feet and they don't even look to shoot. They pass it out and they want to shoot a 30-footer. Larry is not like that. You watch his Miami team. He lets them take the good shot. So you knew he'd be a coach, but did you ever think he'd still be coaching 52 years later? Yeah. <laughs> That's a long time. Yeah, I think he can coach. He likes it. He loves it. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And he was at uh, George Basin for a long time, but now he's – in the ACC, and that's a primo job. He's not giving up that job unless they, they pry him out. Final four so, last year, so he's doing okay, right? Yeah, that's, and he uh, must no be bad. making big money. <laughs> it would seem like it. The Friars and uh, Miami may be on a collision course uh, to play in that tournament in the That'll Bahamas fun. this weekend. Uh, I'd like to talk just a little bit about your, your place in the history of Rhode Island basketball. And this is a little bit of a stretch, but I'm thinking of a lineage. It starts with you, goes to Tom Garrick, then you can maybe go to Chris Heron. That's Fall River, but you know, close enough. His coach was a PC guy. Joe Mazzula, the Celtics coach, and Tyler Kolick, now the biggest player of the year at Marquette. Do you take any pride in seeing what's become of Rhode Island basketball? And you see 
anything to that idea that you, you may be kind of a linchpin to some of what's happened since? I think only you could figure that, figure that out because I wouldn't have even thought of that. Um, well, it's all yours now. Yeah, so. I, um, you know, one good thing, when Marquette came and played Providence, I went over to meet that guy, Tyler, and, uh, from Cumberland, and uh, I introduced myself, and he said to me, you know, a lot of people compare my game with yours. And I said, wow, that's pretty interesting. Good luck. So I'm, I'm happy for him. He, he, he loves the game. He works hard. You know, I know Joe Mazzulla. I know Garrick. They, they all played hard. You know, uh, I think a lot of people underestimate, you know, people in Rhode Island that play basketball. Uh, but the guy that stands out to me, Joey Hassett was a great high school player and college player. The guy that stands out to me is the guy in my book, Marvin Bonds, he was one mm. hell of a basketball player. And with him, Joe, he could even make you the point guard with that guy <laughs> playing. Not so sure about that, but thanks anyway. So, well, that's, uh, that's uh, all I've got on my mind, Ernie. Thanks so much. This has been a lot of fun. Oh, Appreciate thank your you. time. I this enjoyed is good. it. And once again, folks, the name of the book is Star with a Broken Heart, available from Barnes & Noble. Again, book signings coming up. Uh, games at the app and at the Barnes & Noble store here on the Providence College campus. Really uh, happy you joined us for this conversation. For our producer, Chris Judge, our crew, Ryan Hanowich and Bridget Anthony, I'm Joe Carr. Thanks very much. Have a good day.